Hello, Lena. Welcome to Mr. Quaker's Teachers. In this lesson, I'll be analyzing Charles Tennyson Tennis poem on finding a small fly crushed in a book. Um, I'll speak about the themes, the figures of speech, the poet's tone, the mood, the point of view, the structure of the poem, the poetic devices, and um, other important aspects and stylistic devices that Athena uses to strikingly present the image of a small dead fly that he found by chance um, in a small book. Let's dive in. Now, let me begin by first speaking about the poet Charles Tennyson Turner. He was born Charles Tennyson on the 4th of July, 1808, and died on the 25th of April, 1879. He was an English poet, born in Summersby, Lincolnshire. He was an elder brother of Alfred Tennyson. That's another poet. His friendship and, in quotes, heart union with his brother is revealed in poems by two brothers, which was written in 1829. Another poet brother was Friedrich Tennyson. So, I mean, essentially, all the brothers were poets. Now, in 1833, Charles was ordained a priest in the Church of England. On the 1st of October, 1835, he changed his surname to Turner after inheriting the estate of his granduncle, the Reverend Samuel Turner of Kaistor in Lincolnshire. On 24th May, 1836, he married Louisa Selwood, the younger sister of Alfred's future wife. She later suffered from mental illness and became an opium addict. Charles died in 25th, sorry, on the 25th of April 1879 at the age of 70 at 6 Imperial Square in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire. So that essentially is a brief um, history on the poet. So I don't usually talk too much on the poet because, I mean, the meat or what you're going to be examined on is going to be on the poem itself. And that's what we are going to do next. Now, this other poem appears in your anthology. Um, it's a sonnet. And then in terms of the structure, it appears to be, you know, rather well coordinated. We're going to talk about the structure um, as we as we as we build on. I'm going to speak about about the structure as we as I build on in the analysis. And then also something else I want you to um, please do is that. Please listen to the accompanying um, analysis that follows this um, this analysis, the elements of literature, because there I talk about the themes. I talk about each of these elements in a note form. So if you want to maybe just break down the poem in terms of the note, like the, the themes, the figures of speech, other devices and uh, that Tena uses, you can easily do that with the elements of literature. Let me begin the analysis now by reading the poem on finding a small fly crushed in a book, Charles Tennyson Turner. Some hand that never meant to do thee hurt has crushed thee here between these pages pent. But thou hast left thy own fair monument, thy wings gleam out and tell me what thou wert. Oh, that the memories which survive us here were half as lovely as these wings of thine, pure relics of a blameless life that shine. Now thou art gone, our doom is ever near. The peril is beside us day by day. The book will close upon us, it may be, just as we lift ourselves to soar away upon the summer airs. But unlike thee, the closing book may stop our vital breath, yet leave no luster on our page of death. So, uh, I, I mean, if I continue, um, I want you to know that legacy and death are key um, themes in this poem. Now, let me begin by speaking about the title of the poem. On finding a fly crush in a book. Um, the title signals that the dead fly is unique. Now, the word finding presents the fly's carcass or remains as a hidden treasure that was discovered by chance. Now, also, the poet's characterization or description of the fly as small tells that it will be considered inconsequential because of its meager, you know, or, or small size. Now, this explanation is ironic because. Figuratively, even with its infinitesimal size, which is another um, synonym for small, it communicates deep life lessons to the poet and also to the reader. 
Finally, Cross in the book reveals that the fly experienced a painful and brutal death. That is the note on the title. So, you know, now, in terms of the poem, Tanner opens the poem, or the, I mean, the poetic voice opens the poem by conjecturing, as a conjecture, about the, what who caused a small fly's death. Now, it's con, con, conjecture is evidenced by its use of some hand. So that exposes that he's unsure about the identity of the individual that is responsible for the fly's death. Now, this is really, really important because his inability, that's a poetic voice's inability to tell the identity of the death, dead fly killer, suggests that he is, you know, a limited third person narrator. Now, furthermore, the word hand is a sinidoki because Tena uses the body part there, the hand, are to represent the fly skill as a whole. So, Sinedok is where you use a, um, a part to represent the whole. So, we see the conjecturing and also the use of Sinedok from the first two words in the poem. Now, the, um, he, the other comma that after he uses a comma after I say some hand, which creates a slight pause before I set in, and the assertion ends the line actually, that never meant to do the head. Now, his assertion that never meant to do the hurt is shocking because it presents him, that's a poetic voice, as an all-knowing or an omniscient narrator. Which he is not. Because if he does not know who killed the fly, how can he be certain that a person did not do it on purpose? Now, never meant to do the hurt also comes across as Tenner's opinion because of his use of comments. Now, you could, you could read this as some hand has crushed the here between these pages spent. So the bit where it says that never meant to do the head there is the poetic voices, you know, um, opinion. So, the, and, and this is really, really important because it's, it suggests that he's 100% certain. We know that he's, he's not, he's, he's a limited um, narrator or is a limited poetic voice. But then he, he sounds as if he's extreme, he's certain, 100% certain that the unidentified person had no ulterior motives. For the fly. Now, additionally, Turner's use of the, the AK variant of the modern second person pronoun you, shows that he's speaking in early modern English or is using early modern English and he's also speaking in the second person point of view. Now, this, this is very, very important because the use of the second person point of view shows that the poetic voice is addressing the dead fly directly. He's not speaking to the reader. And that's something that is really, really important. That never meant to do the head. It's like it's pointing to him and then speaking to him directly. Now, finally, the last word of the line, hurt, shows that the poet or the poetic voice believes that the unidentified person did not intend to cause the fly any pain or suffering. He ends the line with a comma, which indicates a fleeting pause. Now, in the second line, the poetic voice reveals how the fly died by continuing has crushed D. He, the use of the word crushed to describe the circumstance by which the fly died sh shows that it suffered a very brutal death. So the, the, the fly suffered a, suffered a very, very brutal death. Crushed also provides a vivid visual image of the fly being flattened to death by the coming together of the pages of a book. So it means that, I mean, if um, the, the fly was crushed, it means it was flattened. Again, another synonym for the word crushed. And this is really, really useful. So the poet wants the, 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 the reader, and by extension also the fly, to know that he realizes that it suffered a very, very brutal death. Also, like in the first line of the poem, the poetic voice again refers to the dead fly with the archaic second person pronoun V which is you in modern English. Again, understand this because the, the, the poem, like I mentioned, is written in early modern English. Here as well, his use of the second pers uh, pers uh, persona, uh, person pronoun shows that he's speaking directly to the fly. So he, the, the, the poet wants us, or the poetic voice wants us to know that he's speaking directly to the fly, not the reader. The fourth word of the line here suggests that Turner or the poetic voice sees the exact location of the dead fly and is pointing it out to the reader or also to the, you know, um, to the dead fly. The phrase between these pages provides vivid visual image of the fly's remains strewn. So it is spread across 
a many page book. Additionally, the poet's use of pens, the AK variant of the modern phrase pent up, provides vivid visual image of the fly being deliberately shut inside the book as if it is in a tomb or a sepulchre, something like that. So, as Crash D here in this page is pent. So, the it's very, very easy to, to reveal that the, the fly is in the, the pages of the book or inside the book. His use of alliteration, seeing the repetition of the P sound in pages pent, provides auditory imagery of the book being quickly snapshot. These details make the reader question if the fly's death was in fact an accident. Did the fly really die by accident? He concludes the second line of the poem with a semicolon, which indicates that the first and the second lines of the, of the poem is an independent clause. Now, Tena begins the third line with a conjunction but, which indicates that he's ready to provide contrary information. He will later argue that although the fly died brutally or suffered a brutal death, its demise has a positive outcome. He argues this by claiming, Thou hast left thy own fair monument. Now, this line is very, very important because it is inundated with metaphors. Now, the second word, thou, is another archaic variant of the word you, which again emphasizes that Tena is still speaking in the second person in, mod, in um, early modern English. So he's speaking directly to the, the fly in early modern English. As left suggests that the fly deliberately left itself behind, you know, as an act of defiance or as some sort of like a marker that declares I was here. You know, one of the most poignant um, movies I've watched is Shawshank Redemption. And in, in that movie, there's an elderly man who has stayed in prison for an extremely long time. And when he's finally released, he was working in a shop. And then he decided to, to I mean, um, kill himself. He wrote his name. Brooke was here. So there's a sense that this fly is lifting, is leaving left markers on the page to show that I was here. Thine is an archaic variant of the more modern second person possessive pronoun yours. So we see that you is used in V, and then thine is also yours, which again reiterates that Tena is still speaking directly to the dead fly in the second person. While own communicates that the fair monument is the flies. Now you're going to see. That what the fair monument means in terms of its metaphorical meaning. Now, furthermore, his characterization of the flies remains as fair shows that he admires it. So it's something that is beautiful. It's something that he admires. While monument is a metaphor for the fly's legacy. So here we see the use of a metaphor here. So when he says fair monument, you've, you've left behind a wonderful and an admirable, a beautiful legacy. So monument is a metaphor for legacy. Monument also communicates that the fly's legacy will endure for a long time. So it's not something that is going to that ends after it's, it dies. It, 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 it now that it, it is dead, it's going to remain for a long time. It's going to survive the fly. Fair monument therefore means that to him, that's the poetic voice or the poet, the dead flies left an enviable legacy. So the legacy that was left by the dead fly is something that he envies. In fact, we're going to see that in a bit. How he talks about how lovely it is. Now, Tenna's characterization of the fly's remains or legacy, that's, remember, when you think of the word monument, think that, understand that the word monument is a metaphor for legacy. So when you, so with, with the, what, Tenna's characterization of the fly's remains or, or legacy with words of admiration exposes that he is awed by it and converts him for, for himself. He wants such a legacy for himself. Now, more literally, literally, uh, literally sorry, however, four monuments communicates that the fly consciously erected the superstructure, its body. So think of the literal meaning of the word monument. So when it comes to the literal meaning, the fly's remains is like a literal superstructure to that it left behind to commemorate itself and its achievement as a notable creature. But the more you think about the word monument in terms of the figurative sense, then the word monument here as figuratively means the fly's legacy. He continues his exaltation you know, of the dead fly into the fourth line of the sonnet by referring to it as 
thy. You see, another equivalent of the more modern your. So again, this constant um, idea of the language of the, of the poem is very, very important. For us to understand that, this is not modern English. Right? This is not modern English. Now, additionally, he continues and says, your, which highlights that the name body part, he says, thy wings, belongs to the dead fly. So it's, it's speaking here, again, still directly to the fly. So we've seen the use of D, I mean, twice, thine, and also see die as well. Its use of the plural wings also tells that the remains of the fly is still intact for the most part. Remember, it was flattened, but then for the most part, it's still intact. Now, figuratively, wings is also a metaphor for the fly's achievements. Hello, Lena. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson so far. This is a sample video analysis of this poem. To access the full analysis, purchase it or the entire course with detailed analysis of all the 15 poems, the elements of literature in each poem, and IGCS style questions, both passage-based and general. There are also a star quality sample essays as well at mrquickestitches.com. Find the links in the description. See you in class.